I must admit that I am ultimately providing these videos with an eye toward my own death, that I have an expiration date, and that perhaps these videos will leave their mark and have reverberating implications that I'll never see nor be aware of. Welcome to Back to the Text Themselves, a series on phenomenology. Today's video examines sections 61 and 62 of Heidegger's Being and Time. We're now entering Chapter 3 in Part 2 of Being and Time. Section 61 provides an overview as to where Heidegger is heading in this chapter with a primordial understanding of temporality, which must not be confused with the vulgar notion of time. Yet to arrive at the most fundamental interpretation of time requires showing how all the fundamental structures identified up to this point can be understood temporally, beginning with anticipation and resoluteness. Resoluteness does not simply have a connection with anticipation as something other than itself. It harbors in itself authentic being toward death as the possible existential modality of its own authenticity. Heidegger asks how anticipation as an authentic being toward death is related to assuming our available possibilities in resoluteness. If resoluteness is Dasein's reticent response to the call of conscience from the position of one's situation, and if anticipation projects toward the whole of Dasein, which is a situation that actual Dasein can never find itself in, then is there an insurmountable distance between anticipation on the one hand and resoluteness on the other that would make it impossible for one to ever reach the other? Or does resoluteness intrinsically direct itself toward its own most authentic possibility only as anticipatory resoluteness? For there to be a positive response to that last question, resoluteness cannot merely concern itself with just any available possibilities that happen to be nearby, but instead with the most extreme possibility of all, death. To authentically relate to innerworldly beings resolutely would then entail relating to them with an eye toward this ultimate possibility for Dasein. In a sense, to see the possibilities available to me through to their final destination in the most extreme possibility of all. So, to use an example that I've used previously, I have this camera on my phone and it's available for me to use. In one sense, I'm resolutely deploying its possibility right now to film this video. But why am I doing that? Sure enough, several responses could be provided, such as all the fame and wealth I'm supposedly gaining for making these videos. Pushing past such an inauthentic interpretation, however, I must admit that I'm ultimately providing these videos with an eye toward my own death, that I have an expiration date, and that perhaps these videos will leave their mark and have reverberating implications that I'll never see nor be aware of. And so my assuming this possibility of my phone's camera, if done in an authentic mode, is not some arbitrary act of my will, but is directed toward the ultimate possibility of my life, that being my death. And this is a preliminary understanding of what is meant by anticipatory resoluteness. In section 62, Heidegger provides a more precise argument concerning the connection between resoluteness and the anticipation of one's being whole in being toward death. First, resoluteness is to project oneself upon one's essential being guilty through reticence and wanting to have a conscience. As such, resoluteness entails understanding guilt not as some occasional matter, but as a guilt that is always already there as an essential element of Dasein's being. To understand oneself as always already guilty is to have always already disclosed to oneself that which one is guilty of, that of foregoing possibilities in view of one's potentiality of being and being toward death. In other words, to make a choice, to decide for wanting to have a conscience, and so to understand oneself as being guilty necessarily entails anticipating one's own death, 
That is, death in the existential sense of Dasein's being whole. Dasein's constant being guilty is always a factical potentiality of being. I'm always guilty, and so there's always a possibility of my understanding myself as such. Resoluteness, then, is to understand oneself in this potentiality of being. Yet, Dasein's authentic potentiality of being is also always a being toward death that Dasein understands and discloses in anticipation. So Heidegger concludes that resoluteness only becomes authentic in and through anticipation. Through anticipatory resoluteness, Dasein authentically understands its potentiality for being guilty, which becomes driven into the conscience that calls us toward it, making that possibility, in fact, impossible to surmount. One's resolute wanting to have a conscience signals a readiness for being summoned to this insurmountable possibility. Now, if what I've said hasn't been challenging enough, the final paragraph on page 294 of the edition I'm using is distinctly dense and challenging to work through. I want to break it down here first and then take a step back to comment more generally on Heidegger's style of thinking. In this paragraph, he states that resoluteness leads us to the primordial truth of existence, which is Dasein's disclosing to itself in its factical potentiality of being. So we might say that in deciding to be more than I am, I find myself showing me myself in that potentiality as it is now always already available to me. Appropriating this self-disclosure and identifying it as myself means being certain and holding for true that which is being discovered through resoluteness. So what do being certain and holding for true mean here? First, such certainty is not a rigid one. We're not dealing with objectively present certainties, but existential ones, which entails a very different way of relating to certainty. This being certain through resoluteness is not rigid because one always remains open to the possibility of this resoluteness being taken back or withdrawn. Well, what does this taking it back mean? It does not first mean falling back into an inauthentic irresoluteness. Instead, an openness to taking resoluteness back means keeping oneself free for the whole potentiality of being, which, as death, is the possibility that would necessarily take back resoluteness. To say it another way, being certain and holding for true what resoluteness discloses is not a rigid certainty because it is open to the certainty that one day death will come and take back resoluteness in taking back factical design, who will return to its nothingness. So this being certain that arises through resoluteness is the anticipation of death. And herein, Heidegger has attempted to show how anticipation and resoluteness are intrinsically and necessarily intertwined. However, because of the indefiniteness of death, which itself is an absolute certainty, and because Dasein is eki primordially in the truth and untruth, anticipatory resoluteness also delivers to Dasein a co-certainty of irresoluteness. Through anticipatory resoluteness, Dasein always remains open to its potential fallenness. Nonetheless, it is only through the anticipatory resoluteness of authentic Dasein that this other certainty concerning the fallenness of an inauthentic Dasein could even be disclosed, as such a thought would be unintelligible to the everyday common sense interpretation of Dasein. Heidegger adds that anticipatory resoluteness is not about overcoming death, nor fleeing from the world, nor about idealistic expectations of soaring above existence and its possibilities. Instead, anticipatory resoluteness entails gaining power over the existence of Dasein, a clearing away of that which has been covered over of Dasein, of wanting to have a conscience without reducing resoluteness to the illusion of action. And all of this arising from a serious consideration of Dasein's factical possibilities. Now, I think Heidegger is emphasizing this last point because he wants to ensure that what he is trying to say here is not some kind of self-help, self-improvement sort of advice. He's not trying to provide a practical way of being in the world. 
but he is trying to shed light upon the underlying situation of our everyday practical life. So at this point, one can understandably be driven mad by the style of Heidegger's thinking. This is all the more so the case if the reader has not been carefully plotting through the previous sections, which he's building upon here. But even if one has done that preliminary work, it's still tough to keep track of what he's saying. And I had to diagram this one paragraph very carefully to follow his line of reasoning. Fortunately, one is rewarded with rich insights into what is being said when we do this. But to arrive there does require appreciating how much of Heidegger's thought is structured like a circle, or perhaps more accurately, a spiral that deepens. He often sets up such a circle, which works against the linear rationalism found in much philosophical thinking. But to think in a circle does not necessarily mean to abandon reason, nor to display a circular logic. It's helpful to keep in mind a more mundane example of learning a language or reading a book. How does one begin learning a language? It's not by only memorizing a list of words, but you have to know how to use those words. But to know how to use those words itself requires understanding the language more broadly. Yet to grasp language as a whole requires a step-by-step -step acquisition of the smaller bits of linguistic knowledge. So where does one begin? Well, wherever you can. It's an endlessly iterative process of moving back and forth between learning words and learning the language as a whole, whereby we use those words appropriately. Another example is reading and understanding a challenging novel such as James Joyce's Ulysses. Sometimes I have trouble understanding the characters of a novel until I've read the entire book, but I cannot read the entire novel without entering into the confusing narrative of these characters. And once I reach the end, I can now reread this story, now having a far better understanding of these characters. And in having a better understanding of these characters, the entire meaning of the book deepens, and so on and so forth. If you can understand something of what this experience is like, you can begin to understand and perhaps appreciate Heidegger's distinct style of thinking. He's appropriated this way of gaining knowledge and broadens it to the whole of philosophical thought itself. This could be appropriately considered a kind of dialectics. Is this the same as a Hegelian dialectics? Well, while certain resemblances are here are not coincidental, I do think that suggesting that they amount to the same thing would greatly oversimplify the matter, but that would take a, a while in another video to actually unpack those convergences and differences. I want to thank the following for supporting this channel on Patreon. If you wish to support this work on Patreon, the link is below in the description. You can also support this work by liking and sharing this video and subscribing to my channel. As always, thank you for watching, and until next time, be well.